Okay, good morning, everyone. Right now, we're going to start our Lean Startup webinar. My name is Kaha Guyashvili. I'm the PD at Chongwan Sun uh, in, uh, Global Youth Lab and uh, Community Manager at Startup Brand Beijing. Today, I'm gonna, I have a pleasure to host Trevor Owens, which is dialing in all the way from Boston, US. Hello, Trevor. Great to have you. Thanks. Great to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, um, if you're not new to the startup world, you have already definitely heard about Lean Startup. Lean Startup methodology has really revolutionized the startup world and is currently applied in the operation of many successful startups, unicorns, and corporates as well. And Trevor has been in the roots of development of Lean Startup methodology. Um, he's an author and entrepreneur. He's a part <coughs> of Lean Venture Partners, mentor Chan Accelerator, and CEO and founder of Javelin, which created a global Lean Startup machine workshop series that trained tens of thousands um, uh, founders of startups and also companies such as Google, General Electric, Intuit, and others. So it's awesome to have him here. Right now, I will guide you in um, through our um, agenda of the event. First of all, we'll introduce shortly the Startup Grand Beijing and the lab, the main organizers of the event. Afterwards, I'll give a word to Trevor, and he will share his uh, deep knowledge about the topic. You're super welcome to ask your questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom or in the, in the WeChat group that we have created specially for the questions. And I will ask the questions during the Q&A session that will start around 11 a.m. And our event will be going to an end around 11.30. So yeah. Um, so let me, first of all, uh, start with the introduction of, of the lab. Yeah, how it goes. So Zhong Wansun Global Youth Lab, also known as a lab, is one of the organizers of the event. We are the landing platform for foreign startups and international entrepreneurs. We are located at Inouye Street and surrounded by 45 entities, which comprise uh, our uh, startup ecosystem, such as incubators, accelerators, VCs, and, and others. We are a government-supported program from Haidian and Chongwan Sun government, and we are striving to provide the best landing platform for foreign startups. So if you're an international established startup and you're willing to, to land in China and get into the Chinese business, or you are global talent that you're already located in China and would like to start a project, we are super help, uh, happy to have you. We help you with uh, with the landing, with getting entrepreneurship visa, with uh, getting Chinese uh, green card, and also with uh, we'll help you with the registration of company, all the legal issues, helping with settling on a co-working space, and further we help to incubate you, get the right local partners, can match you with the local, with the right industry players, uh, with the right VCs, and and so on and so on, and help you hopefully to become a real unicorn. So. Our uh, unique platform combines the strengths of a Chinese state-owned company and startup incubator. We have a large network of uh, renowned incubators, accelerators, embassies, and international governments, corporates, research facilities, and community organizations. And we are super open to any cooperations with uh, anyone who would like to uh, help startups and help to grow the startup ecosystem here in Beijing. So yeah, if you're interested, it will be awesome to have you. Please share your, uh, send us your business plan and your CV on the email that you see down there. Or you can uh, direct message me in Zoom or WeChat group. Yeah, thank you. So uh, right now, I'll give word to Yasmin, which is event manager at Startup Grand Beijing, and she will introduce shortly what is Startup Grand. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Yasmin. Uh, as Kaha mentioned, I'm part of Startup Grand Beijing and I'm supporting the chapter in Beijing in event management.
if you haven't heard anything about Startup Grind or about what we are doing and who we are, I would love to introduce you our team and our mission. It all started 10 years ago in Silicon Valley uh, in a small office. And by now, Startup Grind is the largest independent startup community with, um, with chapters in more than 125 countries and over 600 cities. Our platform is creating and offering um, a community, a place where we have many, where we organize many events in different formats, such as fireside chats or um, webinars, such as today. We also organize workshops and panel discussions. For these events, we are looking for the best innovators, speakers, as well as um, founders to invite them, share their lessons and the experience they have met along the way. What we are not only promoting, but actively living up to are our values. They sound very simple um, by just saying, give first, don't take, help others before you help yourself or make friends. But we really believe in our values and we are promoting them and living up to them. Um, very simple examples are when you come to our events, you can meet a lot of people. You can either take this opportunity as just adding new contacts to your network, or you can try to get a real value out of it and connect to people which are leading to, which can lead to amazing friendships. And not only by helping them to help others, um, you benefit mutually from this circle, which is just leveraging each other to, um, to accomplish more or to meet others and, and to support them on their own entrepreneurial journey. For this, we are um, always inviting, as I mentioned, many different speakers globally and locally. So each chapter is looking out for, um, for entrepreneurs who are active in the communities, who are helping other entrepreneurs to move forward and we help them we give them the stage to share their experience and their lessons. Our events are attended by many industry leaders and they are represented by many international companies as well as local companies. So for example, in Beijing, we are always teaming up with companies who are here, um, also with community organizations or with um, startup organizations who are also part of the local startup ecosystem. Last year in 2019, we organized in Greater China more than 200 events, which were attended by more than 12,000 attendees. So right now we have 22 active chapters in all major cities, which you can see in the map and Beijing is just one of them. So if you're living in any other city than Beijing, you can, um, you can find local chapters, you can reach out to them. Don't hesitate, reach out to us to get connected. Uh, we love to connect you to your, the local chapters we are, which are existing. If you say, hey, there's no chapter in my city, we help you to form a chapter to support your startup ecosystem. And all these, of course, wouldn't be possible to uh, to do without any of our sponsors. So we are, actively um, looking for sponsors and for um, partners. Today's webinar is um, co-hosted by Akado. Akado is a streaming platform and they are having also simultaneous interpretation, which you can use right now. The co-organizers of today's event is the lab. They are, uh, the lab as Kaha mentioned, is a organization that helps foreign talents and that helps uh, international startups to get started in China. Then, last but not least, um, I would like to introduce you the Flare Academy, which is um, a training program offered by Pandas um, Layer. They are giving you or guiding you through a training program where you can not only learn more about your ecosystem, but also they match your interests with existing um, startup organizations or communities so you can get involved in your own ecosystem. If there is not a 
community existing that you would like to join. Um, the Flair Academy helps you to, to build a community, to create a community and guides you through this process. So if you're interested, please scan the QR code and learn more about um, the training program offered by Founders Layer. As I said, don't hesitate to reach out to us. This is the QR code of our Startup Grind um, Greater China account, except that there are many um, local um, WeChat accounts you can follow. And uh, by scanning this one, we can help you to get connected to the local chapters in your city and um, yeah, to get connected with many entrepreneurs and like-minded people in your own city. That's from my side. I'm giving the word back to Kaha. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Yasmin. Now we will move to the main part of the event and we will give award to Trevor Owens. And uh, why I once again remind you that you are super welcome to ask your questions in the Q&A section in, uh, in Zoom directly or in a WeChat group. And now please all welcome your Trevor Owens. Trevor. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yes. All right, I'm excited. I hope everybody is staying well and um, safe and healthy given the, the global events and everything that's going on. And I'm very excited to be here with everyone. So let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. Can you see it? Can you still see it? Yeah, yep. All, All right, fantastic. Okay, so my name is Trevor Owens. I'm an author and entrepreneur. And I want to start today with the statistic. You've probably heard this before. It's probably not going to be a surprise to you, but it bears repeating. And that is 98% of startups fail. And if we were to take a look at this large number of startups that fail and put it into perspective, that means for every 50 people that start a startup, 49 of them end up failing and only one ends up succeeding. And the statistic is very personal to me because in my first company, my first attempt at starting a startup, I spent 180 days building something that I thought in my heart, I believed it was going to succeed, but after 180 days I failed and I didn't know why. Two years later, I was looking for an answer trying to figure out what mistakes I made and how I could have done it better. And that's when I came upon the Lean Startup Method. And after trying to apply this method, within just one day, I tried to start the same business. But this time, by the end of that one day, I was able to realize that I was working on the wrong idea. And I was able to see clearly that it needed to change. And based on that, with just two more days of effort, a total of three days by using the Lean Startup Method, I was able to change that original idea into something completely new that actually had customers who wanted to pay for it. And so this was such a transformative experience for me that that led me to now doing what I've been doing for the past 10 years, which is going around the world, working with entrepreneurs and startups like yourselves and sharing my story. And today I'm going to do just that. Over the next 40 minutes, I'm going to share with you the basics of the Lean Startup methodology and my view on it and also my story. So that in the future, for no matter what business you start, you won't have to waste the same amount of time and resources that I did. So my presentation, the slides are gonna be um, both in English and in Chinese. Uh, some slides might only have Chinese, but I'm gonna be speaking Chinese um, throughout the talk. We do have the uh, translation provided by Akadu. So really grateful to the Akadu guys for, for partnering with us on this. So a little bit about me, I'm a partner at an investment fund called Lean Venture Partners. These are my, my good looking partners, Grace and Ryan. Um, together, we have over 30 years of working with startups and starting our own startups. Um, I'm also the author of Lean Enterprise, this book that you see here. We've been covered in 
lots of different online media and worked with some amazing companies around the world. And I'm uh, an entrepreneur, but also I've, my role has been as a CTO and a CEO. I'm most known for Lean Startup Machine and the company uh, called Javelin. So this is a, a little bit about Lean Startup Machine, the training company that we started where we've been teaching Lean Startup around the world. We've been uh, very fortunate to, to support entrepreneurs in over 139 cities and affect a total of over 200,000 entrepreneurs. Here's just some photos of the different workshops that we've run. I've personally traveled all around the world and applied this method uh, on every single continent. And so you can see some photos here from North America, Europe, Africa, and Asia, and South America. And here are some of the companies that we've been uh, lucky enough to work with and have come out of the work that we've done, some of the successful ones. I want to point out two of them, which are the most successful ones. The first one is Blockstack. Uh, this company is actually worth almost $300 million now. It's a blockchain company that I happen to be the first advisor and investor in in New York. And um, it's one of our success stories. I helped them raise their first round of funding. And my partner, Ryan, he's been working with uh, China Accelerator, where Grace and I are also mentors and have a great relationship with that investment fund. He was the director of their program for many years and directed the program that this company, BitMEX, came out of. And they're worth over $10 billion now. So it's an even bigger success. It's always funny to show the first one blocks that and people think that's such a huge success. But then when I go to BitMEX, you can see the numbers get even bigger. So um, one of the things we work on in addition to investing is a software platform from ja called Javelin.com. And Javelin will help you to apply the Lean Startup method. It's actually a free tool. And um, after this talk, you've, you're, you can go check it out and sign up for a free account and start to use the method. All right, so onto the content. So um, how does a startup become successful? That's the question here. And I'm gonna start with a graph called the startup curve. This was a, um, a, a graph created by an investor named Paul Graham. He's the founder of Y Combinator, which is a Silicon Valley based accelerator. They're the most successful accelerator in the world. They've invested in over 2000 companies, including Dropbox, Airbnb, Stripe, et cetera, the value, the valuation of all those companies combined that they've written the first investment in or among the first investors in are now worth over a hundred billion dollars. So they are like the God of early stage VC investing. And Paul Graham is the founder. He said, this is the pattern that he sees in all of the successful startups. So every successful startup that Y Combinator has funded has followed this pattern. On the left side, we have happiness. On the bottom, we have time. And so um, this is says before you start. Okay, that's what we're looking at right now. Before you start, your happiness, it follows this, this dotted line. It's just average, basically. That, that dotted line is kind of in between happy and unhappy, and it's what you're used to being all the time. This is how our happiness is before we start a new startup. But then what happens on the first day? On the first day, our happiness goes way up. This is super exciting. We can't wait to set out and accomplish our dream. Okay, we've been dreaming about this business for a long time and on the first day, we're ready to go get it and we get super excited. But then something changes. On the second day, reality sets in and every single successful startup before they're successful enters this period of building a business called the trough of sorrow. Okay, this is the point where you're working 100 hour weeks you're working as hard as you can harder than you've ever worked in your whole life and you feel like you're making improvements you feel like you're getting closer to your goal but you don't have anything to show for it yet you don't have that massive growth you don't have that massive profit to show for all that hard work that you're doing in fact you're losing money and you know you feel like you're improving but most people who are looking at you from the outside they just see you going in circles. They don't see that improvement in that progress that you're making. And 98% of startups fail at this part of being a startup. Very few get to the point where something starts working. You can see these little wiggles start to happen. We're getting a little happier, things are starting to work. And, and only 2% get to this magical place called product market fit. Product market fit is where everything changes. You found a product and you found a market that fit together, okay? You've brought the right product to the right market. That's what product market fit means. 
the product and the market fit together. And so at this phase, you can shift from developing your product to scaling your product. And most of the startups, the 98% that don't succeed, it's because they never reach product market fit. It's because it's, it's not because they didn't build a good technology or they didn't build a good product. In fact, you can build a great product that doesn't have a market. And that's the number one cause for startup failure is startups that spend too much time and money working on a product that doesn't have a good market or doesn't match their market. And so the key to being successful is discovering the right market and bringing the right product to it. Being a startup is about exploration. When you're a startup, you're a disruptive innovation. You're doing something completely different no one's ever done before. But most of us and most of what we're taught in university or in business school is how to manage the environment of a big company. And a big company is nothing like a startup. Okay, that's the difference in these two pictures. We have the Wild West, the adventure of a startup, and we have the uh, simplicity and the execution-oriented environment of a big company. In this big company, we already have product market fit. That's the difference. In the startup, we're searching for product market fit. We're searching for the right product and, and matching that to the market. But in a big company, we already have that. We just need to either scale or execute and make more profit. And so when we're starting a startup, we need a new management method for how we go about our daily work. And that is the purpose of the Lean Startup Method. The purpose is to be the way that we manage our company in, the, in this environment versus what most people learn in business school is how to manage a business in the corporate environment after product market fit. We are living before product market fit. We are living from idea to product market fit when we're starting a startup. And so this is such a new idea here that this, has all, this type of uh, Lean Start methodology has only been created in the last 10 years. Uh, earlier than 10 years ago, there was no Lean Startup method, okay? Because 2010 was when it finally became popular. It was actually when we started training people on um, the Lean Startup method and Harvard and Stanford created the first business school courses on how to do Lean Startup methodology. And since then, all major corporations have followed suit. And in fact, my company and myself, we worked with a professor at Harvard Business School to help uh, guide and advise on their curriculum on their first implementation of the Lean Startup course. So today, and in fact, by next year, more than 50% of global corporations will be using the Lean methodology. This is a big change that's happened in just the last 10 years. So what are the principles of the Lean Startup and the Lean Enterprise? Well, here they are. There's three principles. The first is MVP or minimum viable products. The third is pivoting. Sorry, the second is pivoting. And the third is early adopters. I'm going to define what each one of these mean and give you some examples. And then we're going to go into a case study. Okay, so these are the three principles of how you do lean startup and how you want to manage your startup. I just talked about what it looks like. Now I'm going to show you how to do it. So minimum viable product. So remember, most startups fail, not because their product is bad, but because the market for their product is not big enough or because their product doesn't match the needs of their market in the right ways. And so the old way of launching a startup was to spend lots and lots of time, all of our money, building our product in secret. And then finally, making a big launch after we spent all of our money to perfect our product. But if we're building our product in secret, how do we know we're going in the right direction? Most of the time, that's a bad idea. Instead, what we want to do is we want to spend the minimum amount of time and effort in order to learn from customers if we're going in the right direction. Most startups are going to fail, not because they are not smart people, but because they spend too much time and money going in the wrong direction. So we need to make sure from the very beginning that we're going in the right direction by getting feedback from customers. That means creating the minimum viable product. The product that's not great, but it's enough to get feedback from customers. And there's, um, when we talk about this, what we really mean is going through 
the build, measure, learn feedback cycle. So an MVP, the true meaning of it is actually an experiment. The purpose is learning, to learn if we're going in the right direction. And that encompasses the build, measure, learn feedback cycle. And this is a, the experiment board, which I'm gonna show you in our case study, how to use it so you can, uh, you can apply the build, measure, learn feedback cycle very quickly to test your idea and make sure that you are going the right direction and validate your idea. And so there's three tools that you can use before you write any code. If you're doing software, you don't need to write code to validate your idea. You don't need to build anything um, before you get paying customers and know that you're going the right direction. You can do it very fast with these three tools. And you can use these no matter what business you are. If you're a services business, a hardware business, a software business, it works for all of them. And these three tools are number one, customer interviews where we try to figure out who is our customer and what problem are we solving for them. The second is pre-orders or pre-selling our product, asking people to buy our product before we build it, okay? The third is called low-tech products. Low-tech product means creating a very minimal version of your app or your idea with as little technology or code as possible to test it with just one customer, to see is that one customer satisfied by this product. And so these three methods actually increase in the amount of time that it takes and they serve a different purpose. So customer interviews take between one to three hours and you're exploring, do we have the right customer? Are we solving the right problem? Pre-selling your idea actually takes one to three days and this is the maximum efficiency, okay? It might take you longer, but we've seen that the most successful entrepreneurs can do it this fast. In one to three days, you're validating the solution. And finally, with the low-tech product, one to three weeks where you're actually iterating on the solution. Iterating means you're improving it a little bit at a time, okay? These three methods increase in the time it takes, but they decrease in the amount of information that you get, and they increase in the validation. Okay, let me say that again. They increase in the amount of time it takes, they decrease in the amount of information, but they increase in the amount of validation. So customer interviews are really fast and you get a lot of information. You can pivot and change your idea in very broad ways. You can identify who's the right customer, you can switch customer segments. But once you move on to pre-orders or pre-selling, you're going deeper into the process. Okay, you see this, this blue wave here? This is what I mean by more, more information in the beginning, less information later, but deeper. Okay, pre-orders are going deeper, but we're getting less information. By the time we're pre-selling, we've already determined our customer and problem, and we're just testing the solution. It's difficult to go backwards after we're pre-selling and change the customer. We're pretty locked in at that point. And when we go to low-tech products, we're even more fixated and we're even more stuck because we have already determined the solution. We're just improving the way the solution works. So the biggest amount of information, the biggest opportunity to change comes from customer interviews. And then pre-orders have a little less information, but it's actually pushing us further down, further down the cycle of success because we want to get to low-tech products. We want to go one, two, three. If we get to three and we're validating each step, that's a good thing. That means we're moving further along. But we're going to get a little bit less information and we're going to be less flexible the further along we go. Okay, so after the low-tech trial, the low-tech product, then we're moving on to developing our app. And this is one of the benefits of Lean Startup because Lean Startup is all about being flexible, being able to change based on feedback from customers very rapidly. So it's important to understand how much time and money it takes to build software. Okay, if you're doing a low-tech product, where you are using spreadsheets or you are using uh, some of the zero code solutions that are now available, you're developing a product for free and it's gonna take you only a few days. Whereas if you're developing even a very simple app, the simplest app you can build takes between one and two weeks, or sorry, one to two months, okay? And it's gonna cost you $50,000, okay? Building an app in one month, it's gonna be a very, very simple app. I'm a C remember, I'm a CTO guys, so I know these numbers. And, Okay, the, the pricing amount, the amount of cost might be a little cheaper in China, of course, these are US numbers, but 
still $50,000 for a very simple app is a really good deal. So just keep in mind that the type of app that you are using on your phone is a normal app. Most apps that you use are several years in the making and millions of dollars invested in them. So if you're spending millions of dollars just to test your idea in the market and figure out if it's the right thing, that's a big mistake. This is why we use customer interviews, pre-orders, low-tech products, so that by the time we're investing our time and money in developing the software, we know that we got it right. Okay? So that's the idea of the minimum viable product, making sure that we're going in the right direction by getting feedback from customers. Now, part of that process is doing what we call a pivot or changing based on new information. Every minimum viable product is giving us new information about our market and about our customers. And based on that information, we're changing our idea. And so one of the things that most start entrepreneurs don't realize when they first start out is that every successful startup has pivoted. Okay, every successful startup has pivoted. Every successful founder pivots. Most entrepreneurs who fail actually don't pivot. Okay, that's why they fail, because they're not flexible. They're not adapting to the market. And so here's some examples. On the left side, we have the startup. On the right side, we have how it started. So Twitter, which if, you're, if you haven't heard of Twitter, it's the same thing as Weibo, but in the US, actually started as a podcasting app. So the founders of Twitter said, wow, we have the best idea ever, a podcasting app. And they put a lot of time and money into developing that app. And then they showed it to customers and they weren't getting the traction they needed. They weren't growing very fast. So they decided to, instead of trying to, you know, say, oh, the market's wrong, they pivoted and changed to Twitter. And that's how they became successful. YouTube actually started as a dating website. That dating website failed and they pivoted to Twitter. Instagram started as restaurant reviews app. That app failed and they pivoted into Instagram. Facebook started originally as a hot or not for colleges, like a dating website for colleges on Harvard University. And then they became Facebook. Uber started as an app that was only for black cars. So you had to be a registered driver in order to be an Uber driver. You couldn't um, just go on the app and sign up to be a driver. It was only allowed for people who had a driver's license, not like you have a driver's license, but like a service license. So you had to be registered to be a service provider for, dri for driving people around and, have, and that's what's called a black car service in the US. And then they initially changed into a marketplace for anyone to become a driver. OFO started as an app for bicycle tourism and then changed to become bike sharing. Every single one of these founders started as one thing. They believed that they had the best idea. They were wrong. And then they changed and became successful because they changed. So being a startup is not so much about can you build the best product? It's about can you identify the right market need and are you able to change fast enough? Sometimes the best way to be successful is by changing, not by improving what you already have. And so a lot of people who see this, they ask me, well, what about Steve Jobs? Steve Jobs is a genius. He's always right. He can see the future. Of course, that's not true. Steve Jobs has been wrong many times in his life. In fact, in the first two years of the iPhone, there was no app store. Why was there no app store? Because Steve Jobs refused for two years to create one. His employees had the idea and his investors uh, and board members had the idea for the app store. They thought it would be a great idea to make money. But Steve Jobs said, no, if developers want to build apps on our iPhone, they need to build in the browser, the Safari web browser. That's the only way. I'm never going to let them have an app store. Luckily, after two years, Steve Jobs pivoted and changed his mind. And now the app store makes billions of dollars for Apple. So if, if all of these entrepreneurs can be wrong and Steve Jobs can be wrong, that means also you can be wrong. And you probably are wrong about your idea right now. There's probably a better idea waiting for you in the near future. And this graph that I'm showing you, this picture, perfectly shows what I'm saying, which is that when you start, you don't know where the biggest opportunity is. But by the, by the process of developing your startup, by the process and journey of being an entrepreneur, new opportunities are going to present themselves that you didn't expect 
And it's up to you to be flexible enough to change what you're doing in order to make sure that you are tackling the biggest opportunity. Okay. So this picture, you see two different mountains, but when we start where the X is, we don't know which one of these mountains is going to be the biggest until we finally start walking. And then we need to be flexible to change. That's the whole purpose of the pivot. And so the right way to go pivoting is this focusing on the customer, figuring out what is the customer's biggest problem. And then what's the best way to solve that problem to make it the biggest business. Every customer has multiple problems and every problem has multiple solutions. Okay. Not every solution solves a problem. There are millions of solutions, millions of businesses that don't solve a problem and then they fail. Okay. Businesses that don't solve a problem or, or yeah, businesses or solutions that don't solve a problem fail. Okay. Because they're, they're not sustainable. They don't last very long. Okay. You can sell someone on anything, but sooner or later, if you're not solving a problem, your business is not going to be, is not going to succeed. And so the fastest way to identify the best business is to focus on a customer and then go to the problem and then go to the solution. If you try to go from the solution and work backwards, this is what's going to happen. You can go in circles forever and never find a customer for your product. In fact, most startups do this. Most startups come up with what they think is a great idea and they keep looking for customers for that idea not realizing that their product doesn't solve any problem. And so this is a very inefficient way. This takes a lot of time. Maybe eventually you do find a customer. Maybe you get lucky, but that's luck. But that takes a long time. This is a very fast and efficient way because every customer has problems. Every problem has a solution, but not every solution solves a problem. And that's why if you start from the solution, you're not guaranteed to build a successful business. We can ask our customers about their problems, but we can't ask our solutions anything. And so part of the Lean Startup Method is retraining your thinking, retraining how you go about starting your business by focusing on your customer. That's the fastest way to be successful. And remember, success is all about speed in a startup. So I'm gonna go into the case study now, talk about my personal story. If you would like, you can try our software for free after this and it can take you through this, this process. So this is a business that I started um, more than 10 years ago, actually 2007, I started this business. It's called Campus Bike and actually started it in Shanghai, my first time in China. I was uh, at the time looking for a dart and at the, in the US at the time, we were going through an oil crisis, like the oil prices were going way up. Just like the kind of coronavirus, people were really worried about it. It was a big discussion uh, in the media about the oil prices. And so when I was in China, I saw everybody riding these electric scooters around the city. And I thought to myself, wow, could I, like it would be a really good idea if I could buy some of these, bring them back to the US and sell them in the US because you know, they're electric, they're good for the environment, and people are really worried about gas prices. So um, I spent three months that summer, 2007, um, a month in China, meeting different factories, making a relationship, getting a contract signed, three months then building this website. Um, you know, I, I, this is a custom e-commerce software, the picture of this website. This is the real website, by the way. This is a custom e-commerce solution at the time. Um, I got a professional logo designed. We got a, a 1-800 number, a professional business number for people to call us. Bought a new digital camera to make sure I could take a beautiful product photo. And put a lot of time into this design. Three months of effort. Finally, after six months of time of working in this business every day, okay, working really, really hard, thinking, wow, I'm so smart that I could get all this off the ground. We only sold one scooter. Okay, and that's, you know, wow, it's been a while that I've, I mean, I tell the story a lot, but it's been a while since that happened, you know, and to be quite honest, that six months of time putting into a business, it's a lot of time, you know, it's a lot of wasted time. I could be doing, could have done anything with my time. You know, I could have spent my summer 
on vacation, but instead I was spending my summer working really, really hard trying to get this business off the ground only for it to become nothing. And so after this experience, about two years later, 2009, that's when I started to learn about the Lean Startup method. And the Lean Startup kind of started in this small group of people who were a lot of entrepreneurs more successful than myself at the time. And I was learning from them and I said, hey, what would happen if I tried this new way of starting a business? Okay, what would happen? Um, how would I do things differently? So two years after this experience, I tried to start the same business again, but using the Lean Startup method. So this is how I did it. So this is based on the experiment board. And the first step is to start with a customer. So for this side, for restarting this business, I said, I want to focus on people who are already interested in buying a scooter. Because scooters in the US, you know, there's a lot of, it's an existing market. People buy scooters in the US already. So I want to focus on people who are already interested in buying those scooters. And um, I thought that because my scooter is electric, the other scooters in the market are powered by gasoline. Remember the oil prices, people are worried about that. That's a problem we're gonna solve. So if I go to someone who's, who's already buying a gas scooter and propose them my scooter, they should be interested in mine instead, okay? Because it's the better uh, alternative for them. So in the first experiment, we don't define a solution. Again, the reason here is because if you just focus on the customer and the problem, then the solution becomes easy. Every customer has a problem, every problem has a solution, not every solution solves a problem. But if we can focus on that customer, focus on that problem, get those right, the solution becomes easy. Next, we define something called the riskiest assumption. Okay, the riskiest assumption is basically the reason why this is the right problem to solve or the reason why this is the right solution. Right now we have no solution, so the risk assumption is the reason why this is the right problem, okay? So why is it that other scooters not being electric is a problem? Okay, that's a risk assumption. Well, what we came up with, and this is based on your inspiration, this is based on your personal belief or your business idea. What we came up with was that people care about the environment, people care about the earth, okay? The, the reason that a scooter not being electric is a problem is because People care about the earth. That's our assumption. Okay, assumption meaning it's our belief and it's, we have to validate that and prove that. So once we have the risky assumption, then we set the success criteria. The success criteria is how many people we're gonna interview and how many need to agree with our assumption. So in this case, we're interviewing 20 people and five of those people must agree that they care about the environment, they care about the earth, okay? And these are our target customers. So tw interview 20 scooter buyers to see if they care about the environment, five of them must agree. If they don't agree, that means, what does that mean? What does it mean if, five, if we don't get at least five of these 20 to agree they care about the environment? That means they don't care if it's electric, okay? That's how the logic here works. And this was the first time when I actually did this uh, 10 years ago, this is the first time I ever structured my logic and thinking in this way. And it's powerful. So after we have these four parts, that's when we get out of the building. That's when we go talk to customers. This whole process is only 30% thinking. It's 70% doing. Entrepreneurship is all about doing. You have to take action or you're not gonna be successful. And this whole process that we've designed, by the way, is created to reinforce that, to make sure that you're spending most of your time doing and not thinking because the experience is how you learn. So after you have these four parts, you go out and you talk to customers. And so what we did was we put up a fake advertisement online. Okay, this is a fake advertisement. We put it online on a website that people can sell stuff and buy stuff. Okay, so this was a little bit of a trick because we didn't have any time. We only had one day to do this. And we could have brought up the code. Sorry, can you guys hear me? Okay. So yeah, we, we can took hear you. Okay, great. 
I opened them, I opened my AirPods because I, I was uh, fidgeting a little bit. So um, we p took a picture from another website and put this up here and then put our phone number. And 10 minutes after posting this fake ad, we got our first phone call. And it was really surprising because I'd never done this before. So I remember looking at my phone when that first person called and being like, oh my God, somebody's calling. I remember picking it up and I said, <clears throat> Hey, thanks for calling. So I'm really curious, uh, why do you want to buy the scooter? And then I just interviewed the person. And we just did that 20 times. So we put up this fake ad, put our phone number, started taking phone calls, and just did 20 interviews. It was that simple. And I remember, I still remember, of course, I've told the story so many times, I still remember like a lot of what people said. One of the stories, one of the one of the stories when I asked, why are you buying the scooter? One of the people said to me, that he used to live in Italy. Okay, this is the US, this is New York City. And he said he used to live in Italy, now he's in New York City, and he used to ride a Vespa, which is this brand of scooter, which is the number one brand. He used to ride a Vespa in Italy, and now that he's in New York, he wants to get a new one. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Another person said that his uh, girlfriend has a scooter, but he doesn't. And so his girlfriend's always riding without him, and he wanted to get a scooter so they could ride together. Okay, I thought that was really nice. Guess how many people said the environment was a reason? Okay, I asked 20 people all their reasons for buying a scooter. Not one of them, zero. Zero said the environment was a reason. This is my belief. I really believed that the environment was a reason for this. Okay, the bottom here we see the result. Where we're going to do the learning. And that was a shock to me, okay? In my head, this idea was so perfect. People care about the environment. Remember, the media is writing about it every day. The gas prices, they're going up. Oil prices are going up. But when we talked to 20 people, not a single one cared about that. In fact, I even asked people directly. I said, I said is the environment a, a reason for you, a motivation for you to buy a scooter? And they said, no. <laughs> Almost everyone said no. And uh, one person told me something I'll never forget. He said, listen, Trevor, I've been answering all your questions for 20, 20 minutes now, 15 minutes now, and I'm, you know, I feel like I know you, so I'm just gonna tell you the truth. And that's that the only thing I want, the only thing I care about is looking cool on a, while I'm riding this. One person said all he wanted to do was he wanted to wear a three-piece suit, like a really handsome looking suit and sunglasses and a skinny tie. And he wanted to show his friends how cool he was. And that was the only thing he cared about. So that was really surprising to me because I really believed in my mind like that people care about the environment, but then I found out in reality, nobody did. And this is what can happen to so many of us entrepreneurs and what I have seen happen to entrepreneurs all around the world that we get lost in our ideas. We get lost in our inspiration and it takes us away from what the really the customers actually need. And so, just so you know, at the end of this, at the end of the interview, I did tell people, you know, it was a fake advertisement. I didn't want to really trick people, but we had to because we didn't have time and we didn't know how we we're going to get in touch with them. But I, I did tell everybody after the race, I said, listen, I'm really sorry, um, but, you know, we don't have, I don't have a scooter. I'm not selling a scooter, actually. This is just a, an experiment. I'm trying to, to get feedback on a new business idea. And I didn't have any other way to get people to talk to and get there and, and understand if I should do this business or not. But, you know, I'm sorry. Um, and I want, I want to thank you because you've, you've taught me so much that I think I'm not going to start this business anymore. You probably saved me many months of my life now from doing this. And I was worried that people were going to be angry or upset about upset with me about this because, you know, we tricked them. But what I found out was that actually people thought it was really smart. <laughs> Everyone that, that we talked to, no one was angry. In fact, most of the people said that they, that, that, that they thought it was so smart. They're like, wow, if you need any more feedback, sure. Just like, here's my, you have my phone number now. Here's my email. Like, let me know how the business goes. And they want to support us. And I think part of the reason why, and this, we've seen this all over the world where we have entrepreneurs doing this type of like guerrilla interviews where you go to people in a coffee shop and you ask them interview questions or you, call somebody up on the phone without an appointment 
and you just see, see, hey, do you have a few seconds to do an interview? What I found is that people really enjoy when you listen to them. And so I think part of the reason why people weren't mad, maybe they, maybe they were like just a little bit mad, but actually they had appreciated that we were listening so carefully to their problems and they were able to share their story with us that they actually enjoyed the experience more than it was an inconvenience. And so you'll find this, um, you will definitely find this if you apply this method. If you go to try to interview potential customers, whether it's at a coffee shop or co-working space, you will find that people are more than happy to talk to you if you're a good listener. Now, if you're pitching and selling people, you know, maybe not, but this process is all about listening. It's not about pitching and selling, okay? So when you, when you genuinely go up to people and, you know, if they're not busy and you genuinely listen to them, they're more than happy to talk to you and share their opinions on things and they, feel, and they appreciate that. So don't be afraid to go out and interview customers and do this. And so this was the first experiment. Now I'm gonna tell you about the two other experiments we did, but I want you to recognize for a second that these 20 interviews took me one day. And after one day, I was 100% certain that this was not the right idea to pursue. Why? Because I made the logic so clear that the riskiest assumption was whether people cared about the environment. If people didn't care about the environment, then they didn't need an electric scooter. And that was the first time as an entrepreneur, I actually structured my logic and thinking in that way to where I could test it and prove it wrong. And that was how within one day, it was so clear to me that we needed to change our idea and pivot to something different. Okay, previously, I just thought that I wasn't working hard enough. I previously just thought, oh, I'm not marketing enough. I'm not selling enough. I never realized until I did this that actually the market need and finding your customer is the most important thing because you don't need to be a good marketer if you've identified the right need. You don't need to be good at selling if people need your product. And there was no need for this product. So it was time to pivot and change. And so we changed our idea. We changed our customer segment. And what we did was when we were brainstorming for a new direction, we noticed that in New York City, there were a few buildings, like a few office buildings, that had a lot of scooters parked outside of them. We said, what's the pattern on these office buildings? Well, these office buildings are located in areas or neighborhoods that are difficult to get to by public transportation. Okay, see, difficult commute. So these offices are difficult to get to from the public transportation. So having a scooter is actually gonna save you a lot of time if you work in this office building. And that's why there are so many there. So we said, well, what about everybody else in this building? What about the people who work in this building that don't have a scooter? Why is that? And we thought, well, maybe they didn't think it was safe. So that was our guess. The guess for the problem was that they thought it was not safe. And so we're targeting now people who work in, the, in, a, in an office building that's difficult to get to by public transportation. There's a lot of scooters parked outside there and they think it's not safe. Well, why do they think it's not safe? Okay, why is this the problem? Our guess for the riskiest assumption now is that they don't have any friends to explain to them that it's safe. Most of the people that we talked to who are buying a scooter before had a friend that could tell them that it was safe. I mean, just think about it. If you don't have any friends who ride scooters, you're not gonna really know it's safe. But if you do have a friend who's been riding a scooter for years and he never got injured, he never got hit by a car, then you're probably gonna think it's safe and you're probably gonna ask that friend. So we thought the people who didn't have one and didn't know it was safe, didn't have any friends to explain it. So that's our risk assumption. That's what we're testing. We're testing the people in this office building who don't have a scooter, do they, do they think it's safe? And do they have any friends who could explain it to them? Because that would show that, that, that our idea is not true. So this time we're interviewing 10 people we want eight of those 10 people to say that they don't have friends who have any scooters. And that's one of the reasons why they don't have a scooter. So remember, we've done these four things now, the customer, the problem, the riskiest assumption, and the success criteria. Now we're getting out of the building. And so what we did was we went to the Starbucks that was at the office building, okay? so. We went to the office building with lots of scooters. It's difficult to get to. 
by public transportation. And there's a Starbucks in the building. So we just went to Starbucks and we started talking to people who were waiting in line. And we would just ask people, <clears throat> you know, hey, how's it going? Um, do you work in this building? And people would say, yeah, yeah, I work in this building. They'd say, oh, awesome. You know, how do you get to work? And they'd say, oh, I take the public transportation. We'd say, wow, isn't it like difficult? And they'd say, yeah, it's annoying and I, and I don't like it. We would say, wow, we see a lot of people riding scooters here. You know, have you ever thought of that? And so this is the conversation that we had 10 different times in the Starbucks. And um, we noticed a pattern almost right away when we did this. The pattern was that when we asked people if they'd considered a scooter, their body language changed. Because before, actually, it was very easy to have a conversation with people, especially if people are waiting in line for coffee. People are really happy to chat with you because they're bored. And so these people are really bored. Then when we talk to them, they're like, you know, they're happy to talk with us. But then when we talked about asking them if they thought about a scooter, their face changed to look like confused a little bit confused so their face would look a little confused and they would say i'm not sure that i'm a scooter person or what they're really saying is they weren't sure that a scooter would fit their personality and so this experiment failed we didn't get eight of ten we only got five but we discovered that most people were not comfortable with a scooter even though they had friends who had scooters. They were not comfortable because they weren't sure if it matched their personality. And here, under learning, I have social identity risk. And social identity risk means it doesn't match your personality. So think about it. If you, uh, and this is probably much bigger in American culture than in Chinese culture, because you know, in American culture, it's all about motorcycles and Harley Davidson is really cool, but scooter is not considered as cool. Right, it's considered more of like a, something that an artist would ride in the city or an author or someone who's you know, more intellectual. Okay? It's not as like rugged as a motorcycle, Harley Davidson. So the social identity risk is that that's not going to match your personality in the U.S. And you know, when you have a scooter, the first thing you do, right? The first thing you do is you take a selfie. You take a selfie of you riding that scooter to show people how cool you are. And the social identity risk is that when you post that photo on your WeChat, on your Facebook, what are your friends going to think? Are your friends going to think like, wow, Trevor, you're trying too hard to be cool. Or Trevor, that doesn't match you. Like, I don't know you anymore, right? That's the social identity risk. Or, you know, when you go to the office, now you have a helmet with you. Everyone sees you riding the scooter. What are they going to think of you? So that's what was going through people's heads when we were interviewing them and we talked to them about what they mean and what their problem was getting a scooter. So these first two experiments were, were both failures. This took us two days. And so we were wrong twice. And I promise you, if you do this, being wrong doesn't feel good. We're always taught in school that we have to be right. We're taught in school that we can't make mistakes. But making mistakes and failing in this process is absolutely the key to being successful. And that's a really hard shift that you have to make in your mind when you're doing this, is that failure is good as long as you're failing fast. This process is all about failing fast. So if you are getting success and you're not failing and making mistakes, probably you're not telling yourself the truth. Probably you're convincing people rather than listening to them because every startup that goes through this process, they're gonna fail the first couple times to be right about the risky assumption, be right about the customer's problem. But you keep going. In fact, you do this process five times. In the thousands of times that we've done this, 90% of the startups who do this five times will find a validated idea. So I only do this three times, and I'm gonna show you the final one now. So we kept going after this failure. We stuck with the same customer segment, but we realized the problem was not the social, not just the social identity risk, but that the social identity risk, there was no way to try it out, okay? So the identity risk was too expensive to try. What I mean by that is that if you buy a scooter, the Vespa, the really cool one, it starts at $3,000 US. This is 10 years ago. It's $3,000. 
US or, you know, let's say 21,000 RMB 10 years ago, okay? So that's quite expensive. And if you're not sure if it matches your personality, then that's a problem, okay? It's not that it doesn't match your personality, it's that you're not sure it matches your personality. And just to try it out, you have to pay more than 21,000 RMB. So we thought, what if we let them rent it before they buy it? Okay, they can rent it and try it out, see if it matches their personality. And then if it does, they can buy it from us. So the risky assumption here is that they will pay $250 a month for the first month and then they'll buy it. Our goal here was to pre-sell this idea now that we have a solution and get 15 customers. So 15 customers email addresses in two hours. That's our goal. Okay, so now we have our experiment ready to go. And we created this landing page right here, this website. And so remember my previous website took three months to build. It was a custom e-commerce solution with, you know, custom uh, photos that I took myself with a, with a custom logo. Okay. I thought a lot about the name. I got a business registered. I did everything. But this website, we just threw it together as quick as we can. We just took a nice font, made a quick logo. The first name we thought of was Scoot Scooters. And this we just made in Photoshop. And the image here isn't taken with a, with a camera. It's a stock photo. It's a photo we got offline. And so this website took us only one hour. Okay, one hour versus three months. That's a big difference. And that's how long your website should take you to test a new idea. So this website simply says, Rent this Vespa for $250 a month. If you love it, buy it at a discounted price. Click here to sign up. So this whole website is just an image in Photoshop and the click here to sign up button leads to a survey where they can fill out their information. It says coming soon, fill out your information to join our waiting list and we'll uh, let you know as soon as it's available. And we took um, some testimonials, some recommendations from people who are owners of this scooter, of this brand. Okay. So what we did was we got this website up in an hour and then we wanted to have two hours to promote it and see if we get 15 email addresses. So we shared it on Facebook, we shared it on social media. And after two hours, our goal was to get 15, but we got over 50 signups. I think it was more than 55 signups from people who wanted to become customers. And when I posted it on social media, I got so many comments and likes on it. I never got so many comments and likes before. People were sharing it with their friends. And one of my friends who commented on my post on social media, I hadn't talked to him in like several years. And then he, his comment was, wow, Trevor, you finally have a good idea. So like, it was obvious, like everybody loved this. And when we, um, we went back to the same Starbucks in the office building, we started telling people about it and they were super excited about it. So even telling people about it in person, where we were like, the first time we were like, hey, you should buy Vespa. And they were like, no, I don't want to. They were like, well, what if you could rent it for one month? And they go, wow, I could do that? And they changed, they changed completely from one side to the other, from being like not interested to completely interested. Okay, so this whole process only took three days. Okay, and we had 50 customers at the end of it. Whereas previously I spent six months and had one customer. And you can see each experiment we got more and more successful. The first experiment we got zero. The second experiment we got five and the third experiment we got 50. So learning each step of the way and changing allowed us to discover the right opportunity. And so the main lesson here is that now I've taught you this process. Now you can take this process and you can apply it to any business that you want to start in the future. And if you do that, I promise you that you will never have to waste the same amount of time and money that I did. And in just three days, you will accomplish more than I did in six months. Thank you guys so much. I'd be happy to take any questions. Awesome, thank you, Char. Are you done with your part of the, of the presentation? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, once again, thanks a lot for, for such a interesting information. Now we'll 
shift to the questions from our attendees. Great. So the first question was from Spencer Lee. Mm. He asked, in a real life situation, things often go off track, even if we follow lean startup methodologies. Is there a mechanism or thought process we can use to go back on track when everything goes wrong? Hmm. Is there a mechanism you can go back when everything goes wrong? I think I'm, I think I need to know more about this question. Is there a way I can get a little bit of clarification on what he means by when things go wrong? Um, Spencer, if you would like to, uh, would like to specify your question, you're very welcome. We can give you a word. Yeah. Uh, if no, we can, uh, we'll wait for Spencer's um, clarification uh, further. We can shift to the next question from, from sure. Florian Hoffman. Sure. He's asking, what are the most useful criteria for a problem worth solving? Yeah. So, um, of course, you want to look at market size is a really important one. Um, but we look at, here's the three qualities we look at. Actually, this slide, let me see if this slide is here. Okay, let me pull from a different, a different slide that I have because I'll show you the criteria. So we, we look for uh, obviously market size, but we're more interested in the, the level of the pain. So uh, a, stronger, a stronger pain is almost always better than a weaker pain, but a bigger market. So a, uh, something that we say it's like an addictive drug for a small market is better than a candy for a large market. So you really want to focus on the level of pain being stronger for your audience. And you're more likely to grow something that's like a really strong pain to a larger audience than you are to turn something that's a weak pain into a stronger pain, right? So if, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if the problem you're solving is like an addictive drug for a small market, it's more likely that you can grow that to a larger audience than it is likely if you take a candy and try to make that into an addictive drug. And so here's the three qualities. I actually, I actually skipped over this in my presentation, but the third principle, there was like minimum viable product, pivoting and early adopters. And I forgot to talk about early adopters. Early adopters are actually part of the judging criteria. So the more early adopters you have, the better of a market is to focus on. And there's three qualities that you know that there's three qualities that early adopters have that you can tell if they're an early adopter or not. And that's number one, if they have the problem. So right away, you shouldn't have to educate the market on your idea. If you're educating the market, then like, and people aren't understanding it, that means it's probably a bad business. People should be coming to you. Those early adopters should be already searching for your solution and they should be willing to pay you their time or money without even knowing who you are. They're willing to take a risk, essentially, without you having a brand name, without you having a track record, because the problem you're solving is so painful and there's no other solution. And that's why they're willing to take a risk and trust you as a startup, even though you have no track record, you have no history. So look for these three qualities in a problem you're solving, and then try to find uh, a big enough market really the bit the priority over market size is definitely pain level pain level first market size second and of course you need to be able to execute on it too so on some level you you want to have an idea that's not too technically complex to execute on the simpler the the simpler the execution and the bigger the pain the bigger the market the better the, the better the opportunity So in addition to the previous question, Florian also asked how to measure market size by lean process and how we measure the pain level. Yeah, so the way we measure the pain level, actually in our software, javelin.com, we have a scoring methodology where you can answer a bunch of questions and then you can score, you can give it a, a rating like one to five hearts. And so that's like a very specific uh, methodology where you, where you like go interview by interview for each person you interviewed and then you answer the questions like, but the questions are just based on these three points that I'm showing you on the screen right now. Do they know the problem? Have they been searching for a solution? 
and will they pay you their time or money in advance of you building the solution? So you could even just very quickly, if you, if, if our, if um, you don't have to use our software, which you totally should check it out and try to use it. Um, you could just score it with these three points, like one point if they only know it, but they don't, they didn't search for it and they didn't, and they won't pay you their time or money and three points if they meet all, all three criteria. That's how I would score the problem level. And then for the market size, the best way to do market size is what's called a bottom up analysis. And a bottom up analysis is simply just saying, how many of this type of person are there in the world and how much will they pay? So if you're targeting entrepreneurs in China or entrepreneurs in the United States, you just look up, oh, okay, there's um, 2 million uh, tech entrepreneurs in the United States. And that's how you determine um, like the market size also with the price they're going to pay. So the market size is the number of people that fit that customer segment times the price they're going to pay. And actually I forgot one thing. You also want to focus on a market that you can easily access. So just because a market is big doesn't mean that it's ideal. I would rather target a market that that's easy for me to market to and easier for me to access than um, a bigger market. So if you think about a market like healthcare, it's like really heavily regulated. If you're not in that industry, it might be really hard for you to reach that audience. And so, you know, I would try to focus on an audience that you understand. I would only look at audiences that you understand and you can access. And then I would look at the pain level and market size within that set of markets that you understand and can access. Great. Um, next question comes from anonymous attendee. He's asking, can you give an example for, for a B2B solution? As this, uh, this is, is of an interest of many here. Yeah, so um, when we do our investing, um, we like to invest in B2C2B. And B2C2B is the model where you sell to an individual inside the big company and then that product can grow from that individual to that team and then to that department and then to that organization. And this is like the, the number one way that companies in Silicon Valley are doing it right now. If you look at Slack, if you look at any of the other B2B companies, they go B to C to B first. That's the fastest way to scale. And they go from um, like an individual to like who's the decision maker or go for free to an employee and then target the boss to expand to the team, to expand to the um, department, to expand to the company. The other way is, you know, it depends on what you mean by B2B, right? So B2B is not a market. There's actually three markets within B2B. There's small business, there's medium business, and there's enterprise. And so enterprise is really difficult to start a business just selling enterprise unless you work at that company previously and you know the buyer. I would never recommend you to go enterprise first in your start. That's stupid because that takes months and months of sales cycles um, to get the deal done and it oftentimes fails. So it can basically kill your company very easily because you expect some revenue to come in and it's not versus um, if you are starting if you're starting the small business market, small business market is like one of the best markets ever because um, there's only one decision maker in a small business, the business owner. They'll put down their credit card and pay for something if it's useful. Whereas in a big enterprise, you need to get multiple people to agree. There's a long sales cycle. They're not always motivated by the, like, they're not always motivated simply by your product being useful. Sometimes there's motivated by some other things and you have to understand it. And it's long, it's a lot of risk basically. So for B2B, you either need to go B to C to B or you focus on small business, medium enterprise, or you just raise lots and lots of money and then you can focus on enterprise. Otherwise don't do enterprise first. Okay, great. Uh, next question comes from Clark Rubio from, from Chongqing. Since you started Javelin and other similar lean startup projects in China. What was one of your biggest failures and how did you recover quickly? 
Hmm. Like one of my personal products. I mean, so I felt a, I had a lot of businesses ideas I tried that didn't work before Lean Startup Machine. Lean Startup Machine was really the first idea that took off, and it took off by accident, really. I mean, it took on a life of its own. We organized the first Lean Startup Machine training just to just to uh, learn how to become better entrepreneurs ourselves. And then we started getting invited all around the world to organize the conference or the workshop. Um, I also tried to start a, la uh, a language learning app to learn to teach little kids Chinese. That was like a passion project of mine that didn't go anywhere. I was actually working on that at the same time as Lean Startup Machine, but found it too hard to get off the ground. Lean Startup Machine just kind of sucked, sucked us in. And then when we did Lean Startup Machine, before Javelin, we had like three other products where we um, had moderate level of success, but not venture, not venture scale level of success. A lot of the products that we started could, could probably still be a small business level or like a really good business for a small team. But with what we're doing with Javelin, actually we're we're launching another new product soon. We're really aiming for venture scale business, which means you need to be able to generate a hundred million dollars a year in revenue um, and like go public kind of level. So yeah, we've had lots of failures along the way. And, and for me, the way I approach it now is by just doing this method. We do this method for everything. Um, no matter what we're doing, we apply our own method to validating customers, to getting pre-sales, and to doing a low-tech trial. And that's how we do everything. So um, I don't consider it, I mean, the previous projects are more like clear-cut failures. Now I see anything that's a failure as just an experiment that we learn from and we pivot and we change based on it. Okay, great. Next question is, how do large corporates adopt Lean Startup Method? Yeah, so inside of a big company, um, inside of a big company, it's a really long process actually. Um, and it requires a lot of investment from, from the management. For example, like when uh, one of the best case studies in the book and a company that we worked with is General Electric or GE, you know, they, they did, um, a hun they trained a hundred coaches internally. Okay, they obviously hired us, hired a bunch of other people to train some of their trainers. And then we trained their, we trained, uh, were part of training over a hundred trainers in their company who then they sent to all the different business units to start training their employees. So training is always a foundational aspect of it. But then they also had a whole company-wide initiative around this. And they got buy-in from the CEO. They set up multiple advisory boards and they launched hundreds of projects using the Lean Startup Method. So I talk a lot more about that in the book. I talk about um, some of the case studies they've done and how they did that. But to do this in a big company, I think um, you really need the support of your upper management. It would be really difficult for you, if not impossible, and if not foolish, for you to try to do this without the support of your like, senior leaders in your company. Um, I definitely wouldn't recommend it. I think the first best starting point is getting that buy-in, uh, starting with some training, education, tra changing the culture, and then learning the skills and launching projects. And you're going to have a lot of failures, but you're going to have some successes that are really going to shock all the executives, and it's going to serve as the case studies um, to base all the future projects off of. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to also note that if you would like to go deeper in this topic, you can read the book written by Trevor, which is the Lean Enterprise, which goes really detailed in this topic. Um, yeah. yeah, the next question comes from Alvaro from Macado. This is a startup which is actually streaming today's event and translating yeah. to Chinese. He's asking, in Acado, we definitely haven't found product market fit yet. We have the solution and we have the problem, which is translation, but we don't have the market. Where is that niche market that needs more remote simultaneous interpretation very often? How to find it? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question. I mean, the, I look at the question purely from a practical standpoint. So, you know, a lot of people say like, oh, I can't find my market. And like, where is it? 
And for me, like that question itself ha contains part of the answer to you, which is that if you can't find it, then you can't find it. And part of being successful is timing. Like a vast majority of successes are based on timing and just being able to find the market at the right time. So there's no really good easy answer. But what I would do is I would use a, a tool called the product market fit uh, metric. And you do this by using a survey. And actually it's inside of our tool, javelin.com, the free survey tool. You can send a survey out to your, your customers. And you have to know like for Akadu, for example, who the customer is. So the customer for Akadu is probably not the translators. It's probably not the people listening. It's probably the people who pay you for the, the translation. And you want to send them the survey and ask them the question, how disappointed they would be if they could no longer use a Kadu. And you're looking for 40% of your users saying that they'd be very disappointed if a Kadu no longer existed. That's, the, that's the, the best measure of product market fit that we have. And I think, it's, I think there's no need for a better one. I think it's just a really rock solid way to measure product market fit. We use this for all the projects that we've created. And to be honest, you can have a decent sized business if you get above 30%, but it won't be like a venture scale business. To have like a venture level business, you need above 40% for sure. Or even a $10 million a year business, you need about 40%, but you can have a million dollar business above 30%. Um, and just what you do once you have that, that survey is you focus on, let's say you don't have 40% right away, it's a process. It's a process of improving your product. So you can run the survey, you can get 30%, and then you can look at the reasons for why people say they love your product or they, or they don't love your product. And you want to t take the people who love your product and find more of those people. So really understand your customer segment really, really well. Understand the problem that you solve really, really well. Translation is not a problem. Translation is a category of problems. So. When you're looking at the problem, you need to be solving a more specific problem than translation. Translation is a category of problems. And you're not going to have product market fit with the whole category, especially not in the beginning. You need to hone in on that one subset of problems or sub problem within the translation category where you have product market fit with even a few users. Once you have five people who say they'd be very disappointed if your product no longer existed, now you're going down the right track to focus on those people and find more of them. And then you look at the people who don't love your product, people who say they wouldn't be disappointed, and you try to prevent those people from using your product. So you change your marketing to discourage people who aren't going to be happy with your service from using you or being your customer. You don't want unsatisfied customers, and the best way to avoid them is to just avoid them. And, and you, can, you can predict based on who someone is, if they're gonna be satisfied customer or not. If you really understand the problem and use case of your software or your product. And then there's people in the middle. And the people in the middle, you're looking at all the reasons why they gave you the answer and you're trying to convert them into satisfied users to improve your product based on the people who are in the middle. So attract more people who love your product, fix the product for people who are in the middle and reject and avoid the people who don't like your product. So that's how you go about finding product market fit. Great. Uh, next question. Next question is uh, what factors should an entrepreneur consider when he or she starts a startup in a totally new country? Like he would start a square company in Shanghai. Yeah, that's a really deep question. That's a really big question. So I'll tell you how I think about it. I think um, definitely you want, to, you want to focus on a market that you understand, okay? So right away, that's going to be difficult in a foreign country, right? Unless you're targeting expats. Um, but it's not always like, it may not be, right? So like for me, for example, I'm targeting the startup market, entrepreneur's market. What I find is that entrepreneurs in different countries have more in common with each other than people, than an entrepreneur and someone who's not an entrepreneur in the same country. Okay. So entrepreneurs who come from different countries, China, U S 
um, Germany, uh, Spain, UK have so much in common in their mindset in a way that they're more in common than with people from their own home country. So the general rule is like find that market that you understand. When I came to China for the first time, all of the things that the Chinese entrepreneurs do is like very similar to US entrepreneurs, with very, very minor differences. That may not be the case for every business, but in this industry, the same mistakes are being made with some small differences. Like Chinese entrepreneurs, just like American entrepreneurs, fall in love with their idea and they don't test their idea enough and they don't talk to customers. And you know, they have the same kind of, they have the same kind of aspirations. And starting a business is, is just as difficult in China as it is in the US. So I think when you're starting in a foreign country, it's all about finding that market that you understand uh, talking to customers, but also just being realistic about, about um, what you know and where you fit in. Because if you don't speak the local language, it's going to be hard to, it's going to be hard to find product market fit. In fact, like the training program that we do, this content that I'm showing you, this already has product market fit. This, had, this content in this training program has had product market fit since 2011. We had product market fit and we measured it using the same survey that I just talked about, but bringing it to China, the, the content and the methodology is not really changing very much. We didn't come to China and discover our business. We brought a business that was already working to China. So the other thing about China is that it's such a competitive market. So you need to be sure that what you're offering to this market uh, is not easy to copy. It's not easy for someone else to do because there's, because there's so many talented entrepreneurs in China, it's so competitive, that lots of people are going to, may not copy you, but just do try the same business. So you have something special. And so what I see is um, like branding in the international, like if your product is related to a brand uh, that is known in your country, that's a really good thing. So let's say you're selling German chocolates or you know, what we're doing is we're teaching Lean Startup, which was invented in Silicon Valley and invented in the US. Or if you are selling um, Italian wine or Italian cheese or something like that, or Italian furniture, you know, try to focus on something that you can build a brand for where, where Chinese consumers would prefer an international brand. They'd prefer to, 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 to buy it from an international company. If if um, I'm competing against someone who is local and I'm saying, I'm going to teach you how to be like Silicon Valley in the U S well, then they're going to want to learn from me. And it's going to be difficult for someone who's local, even maybe if they've been to Silicon Valley, but they haven't been there very long. It's going to be hard for them to compete. There's not as many people who can bring that knowledge from Silicon Valley to China. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Uh, now we'll be moving to the last couple of questions. So um, there's a question from Laurenti Klimov. You would like to know, could you please share more life hacks about customer review? And how do you identify that the product you built is an MVP and ready to be tested? Yeah. So in terms of the uh, interview techniques, we actually have um, an interview template, like um, a series of questions that you can ask um, on the on the app on javelin.com. So like when you populate your customer problem and solution hypotheses, like a customer template will pop up that you can just fill in. I think I can just show it to you um, here. You guys can still see my screen, right? Yep. Okay, let's see. So here is, let's see. Do I have it? Yeah, so hmm. So I'm just gonna open another presentation. Can you see this other presentation? Uh, right now, no, you have to switch it. Okay. Hmm. And I share the screen section most probably. Yeah, can you see this? Yeah. Yep. So these are the this is the template that we that we give to everybody and you can get this on javelin.com. 
but it's 10 questions that you can um, use to do your interviews. And it's important to understand that interviews are 70% exploration. So these questions only take up 30% of the time. You should, be you should be digging deeper, asking follow-up questions, trying to uh, understand who the person is and their problems, and making sure that you're not leading, uh, not leading the interviewee. So in the interviews, um, also there's a video on javelin.com that shows you like me interviewing 10 customers and you can see exactly how I do it. And um, we, uh, you never try to sell them anything until the very end, you can like show them what you're doing. But in the beginning, it's just like, what's your biggest challenge with X? And then you, you listen and you don't talk and you just let them say whatever it is. And if they don't bring up the thing that you're doing, then that's an invalidation. And um, the interviews, you're not looking for people's opinions. The biggest mistake that people entrepreneurs make is they ask customers what their opinion is. We never ask for opinions. We only ask for facts. We don't, we don't ask people like, you know, unless you're doing a show until at the end, but again, that's not the core part of the interview. The core part of the interview is what's your biggest challenge. You're asking them about what they've done in the past. So it's not, hey, Trevor, how many times would you like to go to the gym this year? It's, hey, Trevor, how many times did you go to the gym last year? Because if you ask me how frequently I went to the gym last year, that is going to be a more accurate predictor of what I'm going to do in the future than asking me how many times would I like to go to the gym in the next year. If I just say, you know, people are optimistic. And so, and so people are always going to give you an unrealistic answer or, you know, if you ask a hypothetical question. So make sure all your interviews are very fact-based questions. What things have they done in the past? And those facts are gonna give you um, the, the things that you can decide your business based on. So just a couple examples. So here we have the question, which smartphone is best? Okay, here, hold on. Sorry. And these are, sorry, is the, I can't read it because the Q and A is in front of the slide right now for me, hold on. Okay, okay, great. Which smartphone is best? Is the phone's camera or storage more important? Is 10 hours long enough for the battery? These are all opinions. Okay, these are bad questions. When was the last time you bought a smartphone? Okay, which one did you buy? Which smartphone do you have right now? What other models did you consider? What apps have you used in the past seven days? These are all fact-based questions. Fact-based questions we can make judgments on that are gonna be good decisions. If we just trust people's opinions, then it's most likely not gonna really do good decisions. And uh, what was the second part of the question? It was, how do you identify that the product you built is an MVP and ready to be tested? Yeah, so in, remember, an MVP is just an experiment. So customer interviews are an MVP. A landing page is an MVP. Uh, a low-tech product is an MVP. And so the way you identify it is that you have the riskiest assumption in mind, that you have a riskiest assumption, and that based on that risky assumption, you're able to get uh, an answer. And you should also have a success criteria. So risk assumption and success criteria, you know, how many people are you gonna interview, how many people are going to view your landing page? How many are going to sign up? How many are going to agree with your riskiest assumption? You have those two things, and then you run the experiment. It doesn't, it doesn't really, um, there's not much else to think about other than that. Great, and now we'll move to our last question of the event. Um, the methodologies are always evolving and improving. Where can we follow the latest thoughts and best practices for lean startup methods? Which blogs, forums, or KOLs aside from yourself? Yeah, I mean, I would recommend, um, let's see, I would recommend following Ben Yaskovitz, who wrote Lean Analytics, that's a great book. Um, to be honest, I feel like the community has a little bit stagnated. I mean, there's a lot of books out on, on on it, all those people have blogs, all those people have books. Um, we have a really 
in-depth uh, academy page on the on the javelin.com website where we have a lot more tips and tricks. Um, our approach to Lean Startup is only to give you the minimum amount that you need to take action. I think you the best way to learn this is by doing um, and by applying it and having a mentor. And so I would I would instead of like reading tons of books, I would go to events. I would find a lean startup event in your city. I would watch, um, you know, watch the videos of some of the videos we've done. You can watch videos by Eric Reese, Ben Yoskovitz. But in the end, you just have to just have to apply this. Just do it. Just you know, run ten experiments, interview a hundred different customers for ten different ideas, and that's the best way to learn. And and you know, uh, like message me on WeChat or message message like the results that you get on some of the WeChat groups uh, around Lean Startup or groups that Startup Grind is running and start getting feedback and mentorship. That's the best way to learn. Reading is like, if you, if you do five experiments on the experiment board or you go through 30 interviews, that's more effective at learning for you than reading like 10 books or eight books. So I would just focus on doing, uh, you know, if you, run an experiment and you, and you say, Hey, Trevor, like I just interviewed 20 customers. Here's what happened or, or what do I do next? Like, I'd be happy to tell you, Hey, try this. So I would just really focus on, on doing and practicing practice is what is going to get you good at this. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Trevor. We have tons of other questions, but unfortunately we are a bit uh, limited in time. So we'll not be able to answer them all. Uh, we can uh, shift the questions or conversation in our WeChat group. Uh, that Great. Trevor also will be part of it, and hopefully he will have time to help to answer them as well. Um, I would like to thank Trevor for joining us, for sharing this time with us, dialing all the way from the from the U.S. And um, also thank you to all our attendees to join in from from China, from outside, from U.S. as well. We hope um, you had a great time that uh, even if you have already known something about Lean Startup, you, you learn something more, or if you haven't known anything, that it was totally a new world for you. And um, we will be sharing the recap of this event a bit later. So if you missed some part of it or you joined a bit later, you can catch up or you can repeat everything. Also recommend you to, to check out the javelin.com where you can find more information about Lean Startup Mythology. And of course, check out uh, Trevor's book about Lean Enterprise so you can go deeper about this topic and to learn more. So once again, thanks a lot to everyone and see you in our next webinar. Bye-bye, Zhejian. -bye.